That was perfect. Just like you planned it, it all got quiet right as I started talking. Uh, Hey, welcome to Gateway. If this is your first time, we don't want it to be your last time. You've come to church. You're like, I didn't know what that communion thing was about. It's a little different. And uh, we watched this thing. What was that all about? And you're just here, and you're great. Uh, We're grateful that you're here, by the way. So we want to make sure that you are feeling like a guest. So when you come, we give you a little gift. There's a little coffee cup outside these doors here, and outside we can put, I think there's some outside as well for new folks who are here. Uh, Some of you just like to collect the coffee cups. I get that. But for new folks, inside there's some information about the church and a little coffee cup for you to remember Gateway by. Well, we are uh, in the Bible. We're a Bible church, so we're going to open the Bible today. If you don't have a Bible, uh, uh, maybe you brought your phone. You can get their Bible app there. Open that up. Tap it wherever you go to. Galatians 3 is where we're going to be. And if if you're in the New Testament, uh, somewhere after Romans, Corinthians, God's electric power company shows up. You know what I'm saying? Like all girls. What was that? No, that's, that's music. I'm sorry. God's electric power company is Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You got that? Okay, so open up to Galatians 3. As you do that, I want to pray that God will use his word to speak directly to you. I don't know what you came into or from this morning, but into here. We're going to, in the next few minutes, lay down every distraction and ask the Holy Spirit to speak directly to your heart through his word. Father, we thank you that your word is powerful. It accomplishes what it's set out to do. We pray this morning, God, that you would have your way with us, that, Lord, we would come, Lord, with open hearts to you. And even right now, there's a little battle going on for some. And I pray, Lord, that they would choose obedience in you, to listen with ears that would hear afresh and again the good news of what you came to, you've come to do for us, That we would leave here, Lord, different people, changed by the power of your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this series in Galatians is called Be Free. Everybody say that. Be free. Tap somebody on the shoulder. Say, be free. There you go. Be free. We got our Pentecostal moment out. Okay? All right. So God is all about creating family. He's all about creating his church. Everybody say family. Family. How messy is your family? Don't answer that, but it's pretty messy, right? So just put all those families together in one room or one place called the church, and you got a lot of mess. But God's about helping us from the beginning of the Bible, showing us that he's been pursuing a relationship with you, with you, and creating all of us to be a part of a family. This theme verse for us, Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Uh, Paul is addressing the issue in the church of the day, which is unity and where that comes to in terms of freedom, our freedoms in Christ. Many people today are confused about church. Church isn't just a, you know, you may ask this, isn't just a fun event that I go to, and, and they got some great music, and, and I kind of like the, the message that's given Actually, that's not church at all. That could be like a journey concert with a TED Talk at the end of it, right? Uh, But church is actually a part of being a part of a family, a family you belong to where you sometimes wrestle with difficult conversations and have the hard talks and you celebrate the differences that exist within the body. That's what church is. If your impulse to leave a church is at that moment you hear something that doesn't sit right with you, I told you that the gospel, God's word, is an equal opportunity offender. I guarantee you that this morning you will be offended. So just say, get ready to somebody. Get ready. ready. All right? If you leave at the moment you feel like it's bristling you, I'm just encouraging you. Maybe you should, should think that this isn't necessarily the place where all your personal preferences are met. That's not church. You should ask yourself, are you really a part of the family of God, the family of Jesus, Or are you just a religious consumer who likes to be entertained on Sundays? Now, I have to tell you, there's a time when you must, you must, when it comes to preaching the gospel and the word, you must use discernment. I get that. Some of you have come from other churches where they they weren't teaching the gospel. And that's good discernment to say, I've got to find a place that's going to teach God's word. And we are a Bible church here. We are people of the Bible. And uh, we've recognized that there's only one race. It's the human race. All of us in this room, we stand on level ground when it comes to the foot of the cross. We are all sinners, some saved by grace, 
Some today will be saved by grace. Our only hope is in one hope. His name is? You're in church. You can always get that right. Ready? Here we go again. Our only one hope is? Jesus, you did. You got it right. Everything else is secondary. We are not shaped by the culture. We are not shaped by personal preference. We are not shaped by Fox or CNN or political parties. We are shaped by the Bible, God's word. So our goal is gospel unity, not uniformity, but gospel unity. I cannot tell you today how important this is for us that we represent this kind of unity that the New Testament talks about to a world that's looking at us with scandalous eyes. We are a body that's to demonstrate, demonstrate the glory of Jesus Christ, to reflect back to the world how awesome he is and how much we need him. With that, you got your Bible open? Are you ready? Uh, the reason I want all of us to look at the Bible is a reason for this that you actually have your eyes on God's word because it's God's word that changes you. And, and the journey with God starts with believing that God is good. That ultimately God is good. Do you believe that God is good? Many struggle putting their faith in God because they don't believe that God is good. They look at their circumstances and they try to interpret God in their cir circumstances instead of what he's revealed to you in his word. That's why you need to open up God's word and read it. Faith is relatively simple. It believes that God is good and that he exists and obeying him is worth it. It's worth it all. Believing God exists means you believe that he revealed himself. It's not a blind leap of faith. Listen, the Bible never sets to, to prove, uh, ultimately, philosophically, the existence of God. So you're saying, what, what is it about? Actually, some people will look for like the five arguments that God is real. And that you won't find that in the Bible. But what you will find is that in the places uh, in the Bible that God actually speaks and he says, do you recognize, do you recognize this as the voice of God? This is why we need to be reading it ourselves, not just hearing from me. You should always look at God's word, and that should be the standard, not the preacher, the word. Psalm 19 says that you can hear God's voice in creation. It says that you can hear God, God's voice in conviction about your sin, that you can hear God's voice when it comes to longing for eternity. The older I get, the more I long for it. Do you know what I'm saying? Anybody over 50 says, I know that, yes. <laughs> you weren't meant for this place. You can, you can see the, the existence of God actually transcend it in, in the romantic love that's around us even. Atheists say that romantic love is just a science, that chemistry is just in the brain. It's just uh, synapses and neurons all firing and hormones, and they release into your blood system this euphoria of love. Try this the next time you go to propose, guys. The love I feel for you, baby, is just a random assortment of chemicals that I inherited from my Neanderthal genetics from my parents. And my desire to be with you is to propagate those genetics into the species. Will you marry me? It won't work. I'm telling you. We can see and recognize the voice of God even in romantic love. Theologians call this the sensus divinitus. Say that with me. Sensus divinitus the sense of the divine he's working in you he gives this to you in fact neurologists are studying the brain as you read the bible or as people read the bible as they worship god as they pray and what they're finding out is that your brain is shaped for god a neat little book called the god-shaped brain the bottom line is that you will put your faith in someone or something else because you were wired for faith. The question is, what or who are you placing your faith in? Now, when you came in this morning, you've heard this from me before, you sat down in a chair, right? Thanks to the faithfulness of these chairs that you sat down in, none of them fell apart when you came in. You operated out of faith, right? That was faith, sitting down, and the object of your faith was that faithful chair. And that's the same thing with God. He stirs in you by his Holy Spirit. This is all simultaneously, by the way. A belief. He pricks the heart, conviction. And then you trust by sitting down and saying, yes, I believe. That's faith. 
Biblical faith, believing that God will do what he said he would do and adjusting your life to him. I know you've been waiting to fill that in, so there you go. I'll fill it in on your notes this morning. Adjusting your, your life to him. It's belief in action. Faith. Faith is an action word. It's not just a noun. I know we use it at that, but it's an action word. The Bible tells us to be saved, you must be what? Born again. You don't get saved by trying harder or being good or being moral It's a second birth. And there's this question that people ask oftentimes. How do I know that I'm saved? How do I know, Ron, really that I'm born again? Paul says it's not about your works. It's not about trying harder. It's about putting your faith in the faithfulness of God. The essence of salvation is you in Christ and Christ in you. You in Christ, where you stand in Christ's righteousness. He gives that to you as a gift and And again, where you get it applied to your account, as we will see with Abraham. And Christ in you, where his resurrection power becomes the source of your spiritual life. Galatians 2.20, have you memorized it? I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My life is now in Christ. This is what this means. Salvation is not just about having your sin debt removed. Uh, it's sin had actually done more than just leaving us guilty. It had left us powerless to live the Christian life. And so, ultimately, what I want you to see this morning is where you start in your faith with Christ is how you grow in your faith with Christ. And what we see with the, the, the folks, again, in this passage in Galatia, they were trying to add to the gospel, and so we, how we live the Christian life is, is started by grace. And what I want you to see is that there's a battle going on in Galatians, a fight for grace and a, against works. And, and I want you to see that the battle we're fighting for, grace versus works. You want to fight the grace battle, the grace battle, grace-based relationships. Let's just do a little analogy here. Grace-based relationships and works-based or law-based relationships. Do you have them? Grace says it's been done for you. Works say must, something must be done for you to earn it. Grace base is love. It's mercy. It's blessing. It's encouragement. It's a gift that's given to you. Works based. You need to work at it. You need to do some things. You need to produce some results. You need to perform. You need to, to, to um, live up to expectations. There's punitive, there's punitive uh, effort here. There's, there's fear-based, law-based rules-based, and it puts a burden on people. You always feel like you're in court, like, right? There's some kind of judgment coming. Some of you, how many of you lived in a home like that? No, don't, don't raise your hand. But you lived in a home like that. It, it was works-based. It, it, and what's the response to that? It can be frustrating. I can't, I can't meet all those rules that you've given me. And so what do we do? We either just we stop and we quit or we rebel. Instead... Uh, grace-based. What is grace-based? Well, do you, really, do you really love me, Dad? Do you really? Well, what if I disappoint you? Yes, I love you. What if I disappoint you? Yes, I'm going to love you. I'll still love you. What if I mess up? I'm still going to love you. Jesus will help us work out any problems that we have. Grace says you're not perfect, and I'm going to love you like Jesus loves me. That gives life. Parents, listen, that gives joy. That, gives, that releases this heavy burden that your kids are under in your home. Turn to grace-based parenting. There's a little book that you can read about all that. What kind of relationship does God want to have with you? Grace-based or works-based? Some of you are confused on that one. I'm not sure. What's the right one? You told me Jesus was the only answer in church, right? Grace-based. God wants a grace-based relationship with you. And this is what's happening. Followers of Jesus... Uh, the Judaizers were adding to the, go- the gospel, the grace of God. And, and they were law keepers. They were wanting to make sure that you do these certain things. And then Paul comes in and says, look, I've got to make a correction. So verse 1 says, you foolish Galatians. Say that with me. You foolish Galatians. The J.B. Phillips translation translated it, you idiots. <laughs> right? That's probably more correct, really. As you look at this and you're thinking, man, I got a a letter from Paul and I'm going to read it in church. And you open it up and it says, you idiots. Well, that's encouraging. But he's trying to correct them. He's not picking on them, but he's calling them out. 
And he's saying, wake up. Who has bewitched you? Remember that show? Some of you remember that show. I know you can't get that out of your mind now, but bewitched you. That word, bewitched, the practitioner of the occult, the witch of dark magic, the spell caster. Who has bewitched you? Who has put a spell on you? You see, the Holy Spirit's been at work in the church, but another spirit is at work now in the church, and it's not from God. The Holy Spirit is sent from God. Satan sends another spirit. It's the spirit of deception and bondage and lies and works. Don't add to it. It's not grace. He goes on, before the very eyes, your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I've tried to do that week in and week out here. Clearly portrayed what he's done for you. Paul taught them about the grace of God. Paul was there. He was discipling them. They accepted that grace. And now they've been led away, led astray or led away from the grace of God. And another spirit has come over the church. And it's demonic. It's straight from the pit of hell. It's a spirit of confusion. And Paul is being a shepherd, and he's looking out for his church and his sheep. And so what does he do? He takes his staff of correction and says, this is a huge deal. Because you either walk by works or you walk by grace. And they were becoming a works-based religious people. And that's demonic in nature. Look at verse 2. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or... Believing what you have heard. Which was it? Are you so foolish? There it is again. Idiots. After beginning by means of the, of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by the means of the flesh? Sarks, right? The flesh. And what does he do here? He's actually doing what every good marriage counselor would do with a couple who's struggling. Now, not that any couple struggle in this church at all. But in case you were struggling, you might want to listen to this great advice from a good counselor for your friends, right? Not you, but for your friends. Um, and, and again, the same advice would be set to, to the church. When you, the couple gets together and you listen to them, and some of you have been there for your friends, you've listened to them gripe. What do they complain about? The couple that's struggling. They complain about what they're struggling and frustrated with right now, right? And, and a good counselor will say, well, well, tell me, let's go back to the beginning of your relationship. What did you guys do early on? Well, you say, we, we prayed, we worshiped God together, we held hands, went for walks on the beach, ate ice cream. It was wonderful. And so you're like, oh, that's great. Well, what do you do now? Well, we uh, sit on the couch, eat Hot Pockets, and argue over Fox News. I mean, that's what we're doing now. Well, maybe you should go back what you did at the beginning. Start there. That's what a good Christian counselor would do. And this is what Paul is trying to say here through the early church, you got to go back to where you started. Say, go back to where you started. Say it, go back to where you started. Go back to where you started. Now, if you're a Christian, the question is, what was it like when you first had a relationship with Jesus? Did you know God's word deeply? Not likely. Were you just so religious and then all of a sudden you had this experience? Probably not likely. The Holy Spirit wooed you, and the Holy Spirit is the mark of a true believer. It still is the question today, the mark of a true believer. In that day, they debated, right, what's the mark of a true believer? Circumcision. Everybody said, ouch, right? That's, that, that's then. What is today? Some people today, baptism. You got to be baptized. You're not saved until you fill in the blank, right? Whatever it is, just fill it in. Real Christians are the wet people because they got baptized, right? So they're wet ones. No, no, real Christians, real Christians are those who are so free that they, they can drink alcohol. Well, actually, no, no, you didn't read the Greek right because that's actually grape juice. Real Christians are free to not drink alcohol. That's what it will be put at. And then you have these little dis disagreements. Like, well, what is it? What is it? You can find that out in your life group. Your leader will actually walk you through all of that. Just kidding. They're still discussed today. We're still arguing about these things today. Like, you've got to add tongues to your list of things that you need to be a true believer. All of that's hogwash when it comes to the gospel. That's the Greek word. Hogwash. <laughs> a man looks at what? The outward appearance, but the Lord looks at what? How do you know what's going inside, on, on inside the heart? You don't know. This is so hard. God sees the heart. 
If you have the Holy Spirit, you will have marks of a true Christian. But the only way you can know that someone has the marks of those true, the true Christian is to know them. That's why it's so relational in the church of God, to know them. And again, he goes on here. He, you can't just go on and judge them. you got to know them. It's relational. Verse 4, have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? What Paul's saying here is there's two teams. There's the team of grace and the team of works, and they're, they're opposites, polar opposites. If you lived in the world of works or performance, you do your best, you do your duty. God likes good people, so i got to be good people. You meet Jesus, then you got saved, and you were like, oh, that's not it at all. What did I do? I didn't do anything. I just believed he did it all, and that's grace. You just trust him. He does all the work, and you get all the benefits. Isn't that good? That's called good news. That's the gospel. And he said, ultimately, again, this is happening in the church. This is happening even today. You received it by grace of God. And then somebody came in, and usually as a new believer, somebody will come to you and put some kind of pressure on you. Some kind of obstacle or opposition will come at you. Have you been there? Look, it'll come in different ways. Sometimes it's a moral issue. Sometimes it's a gender issue. Sometimes it's a a sexuality issue. Sometimes that presses in on you and you feel like, oh, what am I going to do? But if you stand firm, you stand strong. Don't change teams because of the fear of man. Don't do it. Stand strong. God will overcome. You know, the person that didn't stand strong ultimately in heaven was Satan himself. He was wanting the praise of everybody else. That's people pleasing. For us today, when you cave to the fear of man, rather than living out of the love of God, you'll betray the one who loves you the most. Choose Jesus over comfort. Now, sometimes he'll give you comfort. I like that. But, you know, choose Jesus over comfort. Look at verse 5. So, again, I ask, does God give you his spirit? Does everybody say his spirit? His spirit. And work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Which is it? You know, folks, which is it? Believing, right? What he's saying here is that when God shows up, he does extraordinary things. He performs, listen, young person, he performs miracles. You're saying, I'd like to see a miracle. I would really like to see a miracle. Listen, if you're a Christian, that's a miracle. Kind of let me down. All I said was, yes, Jesus, what's so miraculous? I'll tell you what's miraculous. Coming to Christ simultaneously, it's like lighting a match. There's fire, there's warmth. There's light all at once. The Holy Spirit lights a fire in you. The Holy Spirit enlightens you to his word. Some of you were like, I didn't know who Jesus was. And all of a sudden, I started liking Jesus. And I asked, what's going on? I don't know. But I kind of like the Bible. And I'm coming to church. And I'm noticing my language. Not so good. But God's working on me. The Holy Spirit does that. That's the miracle, folks. You don't need the miracle of someone being healed right before your eyes to believe. They had that in Jesus' day, and yet they still didn't believe. So it's the miracle of God working in your heart. Again, what's, is it the works of the law or believing what you've heard? So I want you to, to, to write this down in your notes. Put your faith in what Jesus has done. Done, D-O-N-E, grace. That's grace right there. Let's be clear. What did Jesus do? He died in your place. He took all your sin upon himself, your guilt and your shame. He became sin for you. So then he put you, put, uh, you in his place and turned around and gave you his righteousness so that you could stand before a holy God and be forgiven. And all that God sees when he looks at you is his son, his daughter, forgiven, set free. Isn't that a joy that that should give you this morning? I am actually free in Christ. The next thing is to die to anything you think you can do. Die to anything you think you can do. That's works. This is important because we're constantly trying to justify ourselves. Remember all that self-justification, but we're justified by faith last week? When we live for the approval of man, we fall into the culture around us, into the mold that's around us. That's what happens. We fall into the the work cycle. And you see this all over the place. The pressure to cave for inclusion. Fear of being canceled by the culture. 
Christians will go along with ideas and lifestyles that do not honor God or his word just to fit in. On the other hand, we dehumanize people who ultimately have no desire. They don't even know the God of the Bible, but we judge them as if they do. And we dehumanize people, and we end up evaluating political positions over the value of the person. Listen, I know this is hard to hear. Is that what God did with you? Judged you and called you names? That is not what God did with you when you were far from him. When you were an enemy, he loved you. When you were far from him, he drew you by his grace, by his spirit, to his word. And your heart was awakened. This is what we are to do as the people of God. To be grace in people's lives. To stand up for the truth gracefully. You see, that same grace of God that you were saved with, saved on, that will transform you to being like the Son of God in your faith. The gospel frees you from the penalty of sin and the power of sin. The penalty, yes, we got that. We got the ticket. We're in heaven, right? (laughs) I'm forgiven. But now, how do I live the life, Ron? Because I'm still struggling with what we call besetting sins, the little things that keep popping back up into your life, like that attitude, that habit that you know doesn't please God. And I don't seem to have the power over that. And, and, and sometimes we feel like it's now we got saved, so now it's up to us to grow. And remember I told you that God's, the gospel and God's grace is like a greenhouse. The seed is planted and you grow within the gospel and God's grace. That's how you grow. And I want to show you that how you grow in faith is recognizing that Christ's finished work on the cross is how you grow, not by your works. That's an outcropping of what God's doing on the inside. The words, it is finished, Jesus uttered on the cross. It's not just to be believed one time and that's it. You're to come back to those words. It is finished and believe them over and over to experience the spiritual power that the Holy Spirit releases inside of you, the power over sin. Now, some of you don't really know what the Holy Spirit is. You're like, I know he's in there. He's like a pituitary gland. Can somebody just turn to the person and say, you, you, tell them where it is. Go ahead. You tell them where the pituitary gland is. I don't know where it is. I know it's in there somewhere, but what's really happening? We think that's, that's the way with the Holy Spirit. He's in there somewhere. He's at work. I know I need him. Or some will say that it's uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible, right? <laughs> we don't know what to do with the Holy Spirit. And there are others, there are others I've run into some of you who are like, I know exactly what to do. I listen to the Holy Spirit, and he gives me the ooey gooeys, and I, my hair starts standing up on my, I get goosebumps, and I, this happened to a young person not too long ago driving down 17, and this young guy saw that, you know, that big uh, billboard on 17 coming down the hill, and there was a phone number on there, and the last four digits, he just so happened to be thinking about this girl that he liked. And the last four digits were the same four digits of a girlfriend's phone or girl's phone number. And then he saw that on the billboard, the same colors that she liked, pink and purple, were on that billboard. And so he thought, this is God speaking to me. I need to show up at her house and tell her she's the one. I'm just telling you, bro, that's a preamble for what? A restraining order right there. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. The Holy Spirit is there to help you and to grow you, and to give you the power to live. Thank God. Go back to the cross and thank God that he's done all of this for you. Listen, some of us, uh, again, we need to understand, we need to live by this power of what Jesus has done, and he does it as the Spirit releases that in you. And he's doing it even today in his spoken word. He's releasing his power in you to change, to live to please him, the audience of one. Live by the power of what Jesus has done, right? Live by the power of what Jesus has done. That's what we're to do. Some of you are trying so hard. You're thinking, if I can gain, gain this power, if I can just do it myself, I, I don't know how to do that it is finished stuff. I just, I just need to do it myself. And this is what, this is what I find some of you doing. Uh, uh, you know, I was kind of looking through some old stuff that I had, and I, I think this is what some of us do. You have one of these, those little radios that you can have in an emergency in case your power goes out and uh, there's an EMP and there's no, like, uh, Wi-Fi, you know, because that's all going to happen, right? Anyway, uh, we'll talk about that later. But you got one of these things that has a radio on it, and so you, tr- you approach your faith like this. 
I got to do more. I, if I could just do a little more. The cool thing, this has a little radio on it, so you could turn the radio on. Do you hear that? That's oh, because it's dead, see? It ran out. And you'll try, and you'll try, and you'll try, and you'll try. Instead, now some of you, most of you have a mobile device, right? And we know that we can take our mobile device. Don't text me, Mark Whitcomb, right now. Anyways, uh, and you can do this right here. And you turn on your light, and you can see, oh, I got a light. But then that eventually will go out. And so what do you do? You have these little chargers, right? These little wireless chargers. Aren't those cool? Haven't figured it out yet, but aren't they cool? <laughs> you could just rest your wireless charger right there, and there's your power source. The Christian life is not this. I got to do. I got to do. I got to do. It is resting on the cross. All that Jesus did for you, resting on what's been done for you, and not living under condemnation, but to be free. I know what some of you think. Some of you really struggle with rules. You're saying, well, what about works? I mean, there's works in there. Some, we'll get to that next week. Don't worry. Martin Luther says, to progress is always to begin, always to begin again. That's how you go forward. Always to begin, always to begin again. Resting on the cross. Thanking him that his acceptance of you is not based on what you've done, but on what Christ has done. And it is finished. You don't have to go back to that anymore. So Abraham, verse 6, believed God. Who's Abraham? Hey, I don't know. I've seen him in the Bible before. <laughs> Abraham, Father Abraham. Had many. Father Abraham had many. Many sons had Father Abraham. Come on. I am one of them. And so are. So let's just ride arm, Father. Okay, we're not going to do the whole song. <laughs> but some of you know it. Father Abraham, the father of the Jewish faith, the, the Muslim faith, the Christian faith. It's still being asked today. Abraham. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That word credited, logizomai, is like a, 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 it's a banking term. The, the picture would be like a, I know some of you don't know what this is, but a paper check. <laughs> Writing a paper check, and it's credited to your account when you go to the bank, right? It's credited. Declared, ultimately, righteous before God. Abraham didn't obtain this through works. He obtained it through the grace of God, through faith in God. What Paul is telling us here is that God shows up and Abraham says, or says to Abraham, hey, hey, Abraham, I, I want to use you and I want to use you to, uh, to, to bring a whole nation of people through you to me and a whole, even the Gentiles, a whole world through you and through your family and I'm going to use you. Abraham knew nothing about God. He was a pagan. He was a Gentile. And he, in faith, said, okay. He trusted God. Okay. Do whatever you got to do. Verse 7, understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Again, who's God's child? Is it genealogy? Is it biology? No, no. It's spiritually by faith, not by circumcision, not by the law. What you need to know is that those who were saved, because I'll be asked this, before the cross, Right? They were anticipating the coming Messiah. They were looking towards the cross. Even that last supper was celebrating all of that, looking forward to a Messiah that would save them. And they put their faith in that same cross in the future, just like we do, putting our faith into that same cross in the past. Does that make sense? We'll talk about that later if it doesn't totally make sense. Verse 8, Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. The Bible said so. Scripture said so. Announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you, Abraham. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Now, again, many of us forget Abraham's background. Pagan, Gentile, lost, kind of a crazy family. God revealed to him by his grace, and Abraham trusted God's grace. It wasn't 13 or 14 years. You probably don't know this until he was circumcised. So how did he actually become this man of faith? Was it because of circumcision or some kind of human work? No. He put his faith in God. Listen, when you met Jesus, some of you didn't even know what the Bible was. Don't worry, Abraham, they didn't have the Bible until 430 years later, the Old Testament. He didn't have it either. But 
Again, it's not based on your performance. It was based on the grace of God that he brought you to himself and he revealed himself to you. And again, you may say, oh, I've never been like this. I don't know what's going on. I watched this happen with my parents. They came to Christ and immediately behavior changed. Like alcohol down the drain. Smoking stopped in a day. There's all behavior stuff. I saw it as like, you guys are weird. They were sitting on each other's laps. They were so in love. And that's why. I'd never seen them hold hands. This was creepy. And then I saw a change of my dad's heart. Not just of his actions. He became loving towards me, his son. Something was going on. Much of that faith being expressed is why I'm here today. Remember that, parents. Your kids need to see this faith in action in you. Biblical faith in action transforms your life. Biblical faith, when you believe that God would do what he said he would do and you adjust your life to him, the transformation happens. Begin to see the world differently. Abraham wasn't the guy who did all the right things. Abraham was the guy who received the grace of God and followed him in faith. This is what I want you to see lastly. You are saved by faith, not by works, but saving faith will always work. It will always work. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. says, there must be a time when the pen goes down and the eyes go up and you stop saying, oh my God, look at what I have to do for you. And start saying, oh my God, look at what you've done for me. This isn't about legalism. Paul's trying to deal with it. And he will, again next week, the law, what it means. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for, it is grace, for by, by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from who? Yourselves. It is the gift of? Not by works so that no one can boast. For we, this is verse 10 now, listen. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do Good works with God prepared in advance for us to do. He prepared in advance for you to do good works. And that comes out of this great love that you have for God. It's his love that compels us. It was his kindness that saved you. And that same kindness and love compels you to live for him. As the worship team comes back and we sing about how beautiful he is and how awesome he is. When you're struggling, listen, in your marriage, if you're struggling, you don't need five steps to be a better husband. You need to think about the million steps that Jesus took to the cross to bring you back to him. As a parent, if you're struggling with your kids and they're walking in sin and they know it and you know it, but there's nothing that you can do, nothing that you've, you've tried everything. You're just trying to love them. And, they, and you, no matter what, you can't get them to do the right things. But Christ can produce a righteousness in you to be a mirror to them of this incredible grace. Listen, we were all prodigals once. We all took the Father's inheritance and we wasted it on reckless living. And then when we were beyond ourselves and couldn't do it anymore, we realized we were sick of our sin. We turned and the Father was already running. And he met us. And that's your child. So when they turn around and they're sick of sinning, will you be the grace-filled parent? It says, come home. I love you. Come home. If you're here today and you're struggling with a sin that's just besetting, it just keeps cropping up on you, you can say it is finish, finished. And I run this race not because I can do it all, but because you can do it all, Jesus, and you're doing it in me. Change my desires. Change me from the inside out. Let's pray. Father, you see your church this morning, and I know, God, there's people here who some don't know you yet, and I know, Holy Spirit, you're working, you're drawing them back. May they turn in Jesus' name to you and come home. Fall into the grace that awaits them and there's some, Lord, like the, the older son who stayed home and they're living a rules-filled life and they're just as sinful, just as far from the Father. 
but somehow they think that their works will save them. Lord, I pray that you'd free them in Jesus' name. I pray for freedom now in Jesus' name all across this room, all out there in the courtyard and online. Freedom in Jesus' name. Freedom in these marriages, God. Break the bondage of sin in Jesus' name. Lord, heal, God, marriages in Jesus' name. Heal relationship between mother and son and father and daughter. Heal in Jesus' name our brokenness, God. We are so lost without you, and we turn to you, and we need your healing. So, Holy Spirit, do your work. We submit to you. We trust you, and we look to you in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing.